Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center, and Damon Linker of the Week. Our special guest this week is Tim Alberta, Chief Political Correspondent for Politico. And I want to welcome one and all and mention something, uh, take a point of personal privilege before we get rolling on uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, namely the launch today of Bulwark Plus. Now, the Bulwark uh, has been free, no paywalls um, for uh, its entire existence. And uh, we are thrilled that a lot of people have chosen to contribute and donate to us. Some people on a monthly basis, some people write big checks, and that is really appreciated, as are all the listeners who um, maybe aren't in a position to make a contribution, but uh, but want to support us uh, by listening. And we appreciate that too. Um, but the Bulwark Plus is launching now to, um, uh, to give more content. I have to tell you that the bulwark for me, and I, I mean this completely sincerely, it is like a lifeline. I don't know how I would manage without it because it's such an island of sanity. Plus it's smart, it's funny, it's lively. Um, and you may not know, but it, well, so I'm a contributor. So I've been listening, for example, to um, the secret podcast, which goes out to people who've donated something. And uh, and this will now be available to all Bulwark, Bulwark Plus uh, listeners uh, and subscribers. And it will, and it's um, just a fantastic podcast with Sarah Longwell uh, and uh, Jonathan V. Last and uh, Tim Miller. Wonderful. You really um, don't want to miss that. Um, sorry, that's no, the secret podcast is the one with just uh, JVL and Sarah. And then there's another new one um, called The Next Level. And that also has Tim Miller, same, some of the same people and Tim Miller, fantastic commentary. So if you need, you know, sometimes you feel like you have to listen to a podcast for work or because it's, you know, sort of the right thing to do to catch up on what's going on. I, I do that with some but this one is pure pleasure, I have to say. <laughs> the the uh, the secret podcast and now the next level, uh, just pure pleasure. So uh, I highly recommend that, and also the newsletters that are so uh, informative and stimulating, and just again little islands of sanity in this crazy world. So we would really appreciate it if anybody listening would be willing to make a contribution to support what it is we're doing at the Bulwark, and what is that? That is nonpartisan, uh, non-tribal commentary where we tell you what we really think and we don't try to carry water for anybody. Uh, and so if you think that's valuable, if you think maybe even to speak a little bit more grandly, if you think this is part of preserving what's best in our political system, uh, then we would so appreciate it if you could uh, show your support by a contribution. You can do that by just logging on to the website, bulwark.com, and there will be a donate button for um, Bulwark Plus, and we thank you in advance. Well, uh, this week, um, we have had, <laughs> you open the morning paper, and it's catastrophic fires out west and horrible flooding from a hurricane in the east and the continuing pandemic. And I think Charlie Sykes and I had the same thought, namely it's the four horses of the apocalypse, although he called it the Trump apocalypse. Um, war is the missing one and we hope it remains that way. But um, before turning to these and other matters, I want to ask Tim Alberta for um, a little bit of a, of a, a dip into an article that you have on today's Politico about the suburbs, because the suburbs are where everyone says it's all going to happen. We know how the rural vo voters are going to go. We know how the urban voters are going to go. And everyone says it all depends on the suburbs and specifically the Midwestern suburbs. Um, Tim, what, what do you want to share with us about your recent uh, immersion in the suburbs and suburban voters? Well, you know, thanks for having me first, Mona. It's fun to be with you guys. Um, I wanted to spend some time specifically 
in the really affluent, predominantly white, like overwhelmingly white suburbs of um, Milwaukee for a specific reason, which is that over the last several months, as the focus on, on suburban voters has really ratcheted up and as the president himself has, uh, has made these sort of uh, overt, uh, if, if not always explicit, um, uh, you know, attempts at outreach toward uh, the suburbs and specifically, you know, warning suburbanites that their lifestyle is going to be blown up, that their communities are going to be invaded by by poor people and by, you know, violent mobs and, uh, you know. Led by Cory Booker. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. The, 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 the ever dangerous uh, Cory Booker. Um, you know, and, and, and the president has, uh, you know, very thinly veiled uh, the, the, the racial undertones of, of such warnings. And the, 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 the backlash, or at least the um, annotated commentary that has accompanied much of the president's commentary on the suburbs themselves, Mona, has been really interesting. If you were to Google this or, or hop into a Nexus search, you would find dozens and dozens of articles uh, and, and, and opinion pieces wherein journalists are pointing out that Trump doesn't really understand the modern suburbs, that they're really a melting pot and that the suburbs are very economically and culturally diverse these days. And which is true, but these people are completely missing the point, which is that Trump, as ever, is, uh, I think, sort of viscerally more in touch with things that are happening in America than is much of the sort of coastal media class. And Trump, in this specific case, he doesn't care about the culturally and economically diverse suburbs. He is specifically targeting wealthy white suburbanites who are, I believe, the people most receptive to some of these messages that he's putting out there. And then, and they're also some of the people who have been uh, bleeding away from the Republican Party the most over the last four or five years. And so I went to Ozaukee County, which is just north of Milwaukee, and Anybody who pays any attention to politics has heard about the Wow counties, uh, Washington County and Ozaukee County, this little ring right outside of Milwaukee. All three of these counties, they have voted for the Republican nominee for president by double digits in every single election going back to 1968. And yet there is ever so subtly some sign of political drift in these areas. And if the president is going to win re-election, his path runs directly through some of these wealthy white communities. He has to hold down his margins in those areas in order to not get blown out in sort of the broader metropolitan regions of a place like Southeast Wisconsin. Um, How did those counties, the Wow counties, vote in the midterms in 2018? They were they were still uh, bloodbaths for the Democratic Party. Now, now, again, though, it's it's worth Recognizing, so I think in those three counties, uh, Tony Evers, the Democratic uh, governor now of Wisconsin, uh, he won, I believe, twenty-seven percent, thirty-two percent, and thirty-six percent in those three counties, which is still um, really, really not competitive, obviously. Mm-hmm. But it's important mm-hmm. to recognize that, again, at the margins. That's a pretty big improvement over where Democrats were in 2014 in the wild counties. It's about a five point average improvement in those three counties. And you're talking about three of the more populous counties in Wisconsin. So a, a five point swing in those counties, five points worth of movement, you're probably talking about anywhere from 100 to 175,000 votes total. So that's 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 obviously nothing to sneer at, especially given that President Trump carried Wisconsin by about 22,000 votes in 2016. Indeed. Wow. It's amazing how small the numbers are that can turn the fate of a nation. Um, all right. Uh, unless somebody else on the panel would like to weigh in on um, this matter, we can move on. Let, let me just pause here. Does anybody um, want to weigh in on the suburbs at all? Uh, uh, Linda. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Mona. I, I guess one of the things I'd like to hear Uh, from Tim is obviously the suburbs themselves have been changing and there are increasing numbers of blacks and uh, Hispanics who live in the suburbs. So, you know, they may not live in those um, wow counties um, in Wisconsin, but, you know, they, they do live in major suburban areas now uh, around the the country. And so I'm wondering uh, how that plays into, to your calculus. 
Yeah, look, it's a it's a it's a great point. And to be clear, Milwaukee and and suburban Milwaukee is really an outlier in this regard. Uh, when you saw Democrats flip some three dozen seats in the 2018 midterms, it was primarily because of exactly what you're talking about. You know, those those seats, the overwhelming majority of Democratic pickups in 2018, those were uh, longtime Republican held seats, seats that were carved into the maps after the 2010 census during the redistricting process in order to protect Republican majorities, because up until 2010, uh, those those suburban areas were considered to be about as safely Republican as any as any districts could possibly be. What you have seen over the last 10 years, and, and really you could stretch it back to the last, you know, probably 20 years, but you have seen a, a great deal of diversity in these suburban areas. And it's, you know, ethnic diversity, racial diversity, of course, but you've also seen far more socioeconomic diversity as well. You've seen more urban sprawl. You have seen suburbs sort of bleeding into exurbs. And where I live in Southeast Michigan, you have a lot of that. You, you know, you have the sort of classic Macomb County suburbs with a lot of white working class and minority working class voters. Right next door, you have Oakland County, which is far more affluent. But again, this is an area that used to be north of 92, 93% white, and it's now something like 72 or 73% white and dwindling. So that is the story of, of the modern American suburb. And this is a big part of the you know, demographics is destiny argument that folks will make inside the Republican Party. Obviously, it was made you know, most prominently after Mitt Romney's loss in 2012, where people say, look, this isn't just a matter of, you know, rising Hispanic vote share. It's not just looking at the shrinking non-white population, but it's also, you have to understand that these suburbs that are diversifying themselves uh, economically and racially, they're also seeing far higher rates of whites with college educations who are voting Democratic than ever before. So it's 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 a little bit of this perfect storm that we've seen sweeping the American electorate in recent years. It's actually pretty well crystallized in the suburbs, and that's why both parties are paying so much attention to them now. Bill Galston. Yeah, Tim. Uh, you know, you're a great reporter. I have no reason to doubt your account of the suburbs that you focused on. But let's pull the camera back just a little and take a look at the state of Wisconsin as a whole. Uh, Biden's average lead over Trump in Wisconsin in a series of solid statewide polls is about seven points, which is a hell of a lot better than Hillary Clinton did. Matter of fact, almost eight points better than Hillary Clinton did. So if the change isn't happening in these rich white suburbs, where is it happening? Yeah, that's another good question. Well, I think to get the obvious caveat out of the way, uh, you know, a lot of the statewide polling that we were depending on in 2016, particularly down the home stretch in 2016, uh, it, it didn't it, it didn't quite materialize. Uh, you know, it was not as reliable, not as accurate as we would have hoped. And so I do think that there's some degree of PTSD that informs all of our outlook on this election, particularly, again, as it, as it pertains to public polling, uh, you know, there, there were a number of polls late in the game in Wisconsin and in Michigan and in Pennsylvania four years ago that showed that Trump was lifeless and that he was below 40 and that there was no way he could win. And of course, he obviously did. Uh, I, I do think where, where the, the difference in this election, I, I think, is is in two primary areas, and and this is uh, mostly concentrated across those three states in the industrial Midwest where uh, Trump enjoyed all of his cushion in the electoral college: Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And again, he wins those three states by a combined seventy seven thousand seven hundred and forty four votes. But who's counting? But who's counting? <laughs> you know, the the other three states that are largely in play, North Carolina, Florida, and Arizona, those are all important states, don't get me wrong, but but much of the attention has been focused and will continue to focus on those three Rust Belt states. The movement you have tended to see, Bill, in those three places is, is in two areas. First, it's African-American intensity. So the drop-off, the, the diminished voter participation, voter turnout, 
between 2012 and 2016 in majority black counties in those three states, or at least plurality black counties in those three states, was pretty staggering. You saw anywhere from a 12 to 20 percent decline in voter participation in in large African-American communities in those states where Democrats have really depended on on pulling, uh, you know, not just big vote share margins, but also turning out big numbers. So that's that's the first part that that both campaigns are watching pretty closely. And there is a reason for cautious optimism inside the Biden camp that those numbers will jump uh, you know, pretty significantly in November. They might not get back to Obama levels. They probably won't, but they don't really need to either. Again, you're talking about such tight margins in these places that if that if Biden can jack up turnout, uh, even you know, at the four to six percent level in in a lot of these big counties with with high uh, population of, of African American voters, then he's in pretty good shape. So that's the one place where you have seen some movement. And then again, in the the, the other place, does tend to be in the more affluent college educated suburbs of some of these big cities of Detroit, of Milwaukee to a lesser extent, certainly of Philadelphia. Um, you're you're seeing in Oakland County, Michigan, for example, two of the most competitive congressional districts uh, in the country uh, in 2018 were the 11th district and the 8th district, both of which grab a big chunk of Oakland County, which is right outside of Detroit. Two years later, the freshman Democrats who won those two races, they are really not even thought to be in danger anymore. And that is because of the pretty pretty dramatic, pretty rapid demographic changeover and also sort of the cultural and political transformation of an area lo- like Oakland County, where now it's not just the rising number of, of non-white voters that's chewing into the Republican margins, but it's also those affluent, college-educated, two-car garage, wealthy white folks who have long identified as Republicans, but for whatever reason, aren't sure that they can pull the lever for Trump again. So those are the two primary drivers of change, at least at the margins. Okay. Um, I'd like to move now to a related topic, sort of, and that is the way we elect presidents and have since our founding, namely the Electoral College, uh, because there's a lot of chatter at the moment online and various magazines and so forth um, about what about two aspects of this? First of all, uh, there's a, a move in some quarters to try to um, abolish the Electoral College. Um, and also there is talk about what will be the effect on the country if there is another race where a president wins the Electoral College and loses the popular vote. Um, so Damon, um, what would you, so I know you're not a fan of the Electoral College, but I'd like if you could for you to give one or two of the arguments in favor of keeping it. Well, um, I'm afraid I can only offer arguments in favor of keeping it if if we're talking about uh, when we're talking about getting rid of it. Um, <laughs> my, my own writing on the subject has been... Um, uh, oh, I like to flatter myself and say, uh, you know, typically complex. Um, my view is that the Electoral College uh, does not work well. It does not work as it was intended at all. And uh, in general, it doesn't, it, it really doesn't help us accomplish anything that couldn't be accomplished better without it. Um it it especially when it ends up oh, doing. Can I? Sorry, yes. Damon. Can I interrupt you right there and sure. just challenge that point? Yeah. Um, um, so one of the arguments that I've seen is that um, one, and I would be curious to hear how you think this could be solved another way. One of the things the electoral college does is it prevents us all living through a Florida recount type situation that involved huge swathes of the entire country. Um, right, where if you had to recount the entire popular vote in a, in the case of a of a near tie, for example, that imagine the the chaos that that could engender. Uh, I suppose. I mean, uh, you, you know, you could accomplish that with any system that had all fifty. Uh, where you had all like 50 individual elections rather than one giant election. Um, I do think that 
the idea of a national election with 200 something like 200 million people voting in one big vote uh, that it would be so close with that many uh, voters that you would end up uh, having to you know, do a recount nationally is probably lower than you would in one state like Florida in 2000. Um, although, of course, yes, it could happen. Um, I, I do think, though, that there are other things that one could institute. I mean, some some reformers think that it would make sense to have uh, the uh, electoral votes of a state be allocated with the popular vote winner nationally automatically to avoid some of the uh, clashes that we've had in recent uh, election cycles. That's one option. And That's there, called the NPV reform, national popular vote. Right. So that's that's one way of, of handling it. But I mean, I'm all for having a big, robust debate about this. And, uh, and I think we should at some point when we seem to be past our current impasses where we can't accomplish much of any serious reform. But I mean, my more recent writing about uh, the Electoral College has actually been about the dangers of the Democrats deciding that if it does unfortunately go the same way as it did in 2016, where Trump loses the popular vote, but then wins in the electoral vote, Democrats should not respond to that by calling it an illegitimate outcome, because these However flawed they might be, they are the rules that have abided for these last 200 or so years, and they are the rules of the election as we go into the election. And you can't complain about the rules after they happen because you don't like the outcome. And the fact of the matter is that as recently as 2012, the Democrats did perfectly fine with the electoral college system, and they actually did quite well in 2008. And that was because they had a candidate, Barack Obama, who was very broadly popular and was able to motivate all of the disparate factions of the Democratic Party to show up and vote on Election Day. And the result was a big win. The problem right now for the Democrats that they don't really want to explore as much as I think they ought to is that their their current electoral coalition has become extremely inefficient with regard to the electoral college so that they win three to four million more votes than they need to carry California, but they barely, they either barely win or barely lose those states in the upper Midwest that turned the election the last time. So um, there are various ways that they could go about trying to make slightly different appeals, maybe appeal a little bit less to hyper progressive California voters and be willing to lose a million or two of those votes in return for gaining 50,000 or 100,000 more votes in the Rust Belt. Um, so that would be my advice to the Democrats. But a lot of Democrats would like to win with exactly what they're selling right now. And so you get a lot of bad fights about it. Mm. You know, I do remember after the 2004 um, Bush win, when many Democrats had thought they were going to win that race uh, and were bitterly disappointed, there was a brief moment where Democrats began to say, well, you know, maybe we should sort of moderate on issues, some, some of the social issues, or we've been a little too extreme and so forth. But that didn't last very long. And in 2008, they, they got their preferred you know, a liberal candidate in Barack Obama, but um, I mean, you could say that that the the party choosing Joe Biden this time is a pretty good indication that they're sort of following my advice. Anyway, yeah, I, because, I think because they yeah, went absolutely. with one of the more moderate candidates out of a couple dozen. So, right, uh, if he does right. win, it will probably be because they did exactly what I'm what I'm advocating. So, Bill, um, there was a time, uh, I think in 1968 or 69, when the House passed a constitutional amendment by a big margin, actually, um, to uh, to eliminate the Electoral College. And uh, it was killed in the Senate by a filibuster. Um, and there have been something like 200 proposals over the years to um, to eliminate it, but it, it continues. Um, a recent survey found that Democrats... Um, believe that the electoral college taints that an electoral college win without a popular vote win is tainted, whereas Republicans don't. 
but that might be, yeah, there you go. I mean, recent, recent history would tend to suggest, but, um, but I'm wondering, um, since it's practically impossible to imagine a constitutional amendment succeeding now, um, are you worried about the potential for civil conflict over this issue, over the fact that we do not elect our presidents via majority vote, but rather by this, this uh, one step removed s- system? Well, it depends on what you mean by civil conflict. If you mean violence, uh, yes, violence. I, I can't rule anything out these days. Let me tell you what worries me more. Uh, it is absolutely true that if Trump wins re-election with an electoral college majority, uh, that will be a legitimate victory as defined by the rules. But political scientists and theorists draw a distinction between formal legitimacy and substantive legitimacy. Formal legitimacy means that you comply with the law and the rules. Substantive legitimacy means that the rules and the laws are broadly regarded as appropriate, consistent with justice. And my fear is that if for the third time in the past six presidential elections, there is a split between the popular vote and the electoral college, Uh, that serious questions of substantive legitimacy will be raised. And that is not good for a a political system that is already under assault. And so I hope very much that that doesn't happen, uh, and that 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 pattern does not recur anytime soon, because there's no easy fix for the problem. But the idea of democracy as one person, one vote is very deeply ingrained. And the proposition that some votes count more than others in determining the most, uh, the most important choice that American citizens make is going to be an increasingly hard sell. And, uh, and the, fact, the fact that it's a hard, harder sell in one part of the one part of the partisan, one side of the word. ledger, yeah, Republicans, uh, yeah, what, whatever, whatever the word is that my aging brain is searching for, just mm-hmm. makes matters worse, yeah, right, because it piles partisan differences on top of fundamental disagreements about political legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Um, Tim, the original Alexander Hamilton's original idea for why we should have an electoral college uh, was that it would allow a layer of, um, of uh, buffer between the preferences of the majority, and that is the, the voice of the people, and the choice of the chief executive, so that a, they would elect what he perceived or hoped would be um, an elite of well-informed men of judgment. It was always men, of course, of judgment and and uh, and um, good good character, who would then vote for president. It has never worked that way, <laughs> um, not from the very beginning. Um, and uh, I wonder whether um, you think that that it is now um, that we are so far past the idea of tempering the voice of the people in any way, um, that it is, it is kind of a, um, you know, a, a problem for our democracy. You know, just speaking personally, uh, Mona, I think it probably is. And of all of the chaos and dysfunction that I have covered, uh, in the last, you know, 15 years, um, uh, with a front row seat to American politics and some of the you know, most powerful players uh, on the national stage, the thing that is a consistent through line of anxiety for me is the distrust in American institutions. And, right. And we see that across the board, you know, it's whether it's organized religion or public education or the government itself, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, we see Americans 
losing confidence in these institutions uh, at such a rapid clip. And it leaves you wondering, you know, what what does this what does this lead us to um, where, you know, it can't be good wherever this is taking us. And the institution of the ballot box is arguably the most important of all. And uh, everything we are seeing right now, everything we've seen over the last several years, uh, it's, it's really worrisome as far as the disregard for uh you know, and I should say, really, the, the willingness to delegitimize uh, election results and to just casually throw around this idea of rampant voter fraud when there's, you know, zero evidence of it. Um, you know, those things are those things are troubling. And I do feel like, well, to answer your original question, that part of the distrust in the sort of big picture uh, institution of, of American elections is the fact that there is one office in the entire land that is not chosen by an outright majority of the voters. And it's the most important office in the land. And I think that strikes a lot of people as pretty odd. Um, I would make a sort of counterintuitive argument uh, as far as the politics of this are concerned, because if you are to just look at the raw numbers and at a half century of demographic trends, uh, you would arrive pretty effortlessly at the conclusion that it is in the long-term interest of Democrats to not get rid of the Electoral College. And as a matter of fact, I wrote a cover story uh, when I was at National Review in 2016 on this very subject, that when you look at just the share of non-white votes as it has risen, and you can also look at college education. You can look at a host of other demographic factors, but specifically the non-white vote as it has risen in any number of these states across the country uh, as a direct and immediate political corollary. Those states have become less and less Republican. And in several instances, those states have gone off the board altogether for the Republican Party. They are no longer competitive. So in 2004, George W. Bush carries New Mexico. He carries Virginia. He carries Colorado. Those states are not even being contested by Republicans anymore. And they probably won't be anytime soon. California was a very competitive state when I was young, when, when you know, th- this is not ancient history. And, right. And as California became a majority minority state, it has turned into the the most democratic dominated state in the country. And you had better believe that when Republicans look out over the electoral map and how close everything is today, that they understand full well that when Texas's 38 electoral votes come into play, and if and when they eventually uh, go blue, then that's game, set, and match, that, that, that it's over. There, there is no more contesting the Electoral College for Republicans once Texas comes off the board. This is something that Will Hurd, the young congressman from Texas, who will probably run for president one day, has spoken to. It's something that even Ted Cruz has sort of you know, nodded t- toward. So I actually could make a pretty compelling argument to, to you, I think, that Republicans in both the short and at least the medium term are, are really benefiting or, or, or would benefit more from a changeover to a straight up national popular vote than would Democrats. Yeah, it's so interesting. Linda, what uh, Tim just described is really the fever dream of people like Ann Coulter and, uh, and, and Rich Lowry, uh, who they are you know, absolutely convinced that the only way Republicans can win is not by trying to appeal to non-white voters, but rather by trying to keep them out and keep them from voting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and, yeah. and I've just written a piece, which I'm trying to place right now. I probably should talk to Tim after we get off the phone uh, <laughs> about uh, the Hispanic vote, because uh, Hispanics do not uh, mimic uh, the African-American vote, uh, for example. Uh, they you know, have consistently for going back now 50 years, uh, been voting somewhere between 20 and 44 percent uh, for the Republican candidate for president. So this idea that Texas is going to flip because, you know, it soon may have a majority of Hispanic voters um, it is just not correct. Um, but uh, let, let me sort of take the bigger uh, issue here. And that is, you know, how it is we resolve the dilemma that Bill Galston has suggested. I too, you know, it was one thing 
Hillary Clinton won three million more votes uh, than Donald Trump. What if you know Joe Biden wins five million or six million uh, more votes than Donald Trump, but Trump still is able to eke out uh, a victory? I think at a certain point it does get under people's skin, and they say, you know, we can't we can't go on like this. Well, one of the ways to deal with it is not to abolish the Electoral College, which after all would in fact take a constitutional amendment, but to do what at least a couple of states already do, and that is to apportion uh, the votes in the Electoral College based on congressional district or some other uh, method and not have a winner-take-all approach. And that would keep an Electoral College um, would more accurately reflect uh, the votes within a state because states are not homogenous. There are a lot of states out there that um, have uh, uh, heterogeneous qualities and, you know, different parts of the state are conservative and others are liberal. So um, I, I just think that the idea that we're going to abolish the Electoral College is a pipe dream. It's not going to happen. Interesting. Um... All right. Um, now, another matter that has arisen recently in the news is uh, there's one magazine in particular, New York Magazine, has written several pieces about this. Some of them a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more drooling with anticipation than others. Namely, should Donald Trump be prosecuted for any possible crimes after he leaves office? Um, so, um, Bill Galston, I'm going to start with you. Um, a lot of these pieces seem more certain than, frankly, I am that Trump has committed crimes for which he could be prosecuted. I mean, I believe he has committed terrible, grotesque misbehavior and sins of various sorts as president. He has certainly abused power, uh, had contempt for our um, norms and so forth. I don't think it's quite as obvious as some do that there are actual criminal penalties, leaving aside the you know possible liability for the Stormy Daniels thing. But what do you think? And then, yeah, and if you'd like, dig right in on you know how whether you think it would be a good idea or not to if he loses uh, to pursue criminal charges against him as an ex president. Well, uh, let's wind the reel back almost half a century. Uh, Gerald Ford probably lost the 1976 election the day he pardoned Richard Nixon. But I will go to my grave believing, and this is not because I'm a great Richard Nixon fan, that Gerald Ford did the right thing for the country. Uh and my, my thinking hasn't changed. If anything, it has intensified because if, if American politics degenerates into a real blood sport mm -hmm. where you know, the cries of lock her up are followed by actual prosecutions, particularly if they are for federal crimes that fall under the, under the jurisdiction of the attorney general, then we are well down the road to turning into the kind of country that we really don't want to become. Uh, and I'm not sure that Joe Biden should pardon Donald Trump. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that would be a disastrous blunder but nor do I think it would be good for the political system to prosecute Trump. Uh, and I'm going to bite the bullet here and say, even if he has committed crimes, I am more interested in healing the nation's wounds than I am in putting a former president of the United States in jail. Damon, where, what do you think? Well, I, I'm actually, I was pleased uh, uh, that uh, Bill came down where he did, and I don't have as much to add if, if uh, as I would have if he had said something <laughs> different. Um, okay. I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, you know, uh, requesting to speak in order to uh, uh, really uh, 
push back against uh, anything Bill was going to say, but I agree with pretty much everything Bill said. And I would go even a little further. And I sort of want to be on the record of saying this because I haven't written on it yet. This is a rare case where I'm going to make a comment I have not written first. Um, but I, I will write about it in the coming weeks. I think it would be a disaster if we tried to do to prosecute Trump if he is no longer president and Biden is the president. I think to think that we can do that is to presume that the distinction between law and politics is still being upheld in our system. And the sad and I think potentially very dangerous fact is that it is not. In order to do something like that, you would need an overwhelming consensus in the country, in the populace, that there is a neutral legal system that could fairly judge such a thing. And we are, Trump's very existence is a testament to the fact that that is not true. It would immediately and forevermore be viewed by almost all Republican voters as a politically motivated prosecution that would paradoxically make polarization and rancor far, far worse than it already is. And again, is that a problem? You bet it's a huge problem because you should be able to prosecute a president who committed crimes. But I frankly do not think that it would be possible in the current environment. It would simply get sucked up into the same kind of centrifugal forces of our polarized system and become more fodder for uh, partisan rancor. And, um, and I, I don't see any way out of that, frankly. Um, yes, I, I agree with both Damon and Bill. And um, unless someone else has a differing point of view, because this do. podcast is, after all, like to differ. Okay, so go for it. Because then I do want to just touch on the Middle East before right. we, uh, yeah, yeah. Just okay, sort of ahead. quickly. In principle, I absolutely agree with everything that has been said. And I do not think there should be any attempts to prosecute uh, Donald Trump for anything he's done in the course of his uh presidency and in actual in the actual presidency. But if Donald Trump has, as I suspect, been involved in tax evasion and perhaps even money laundering in the course of his long career before becoming president, absolutely I think that needs to be prosecuted. We live in a system in where in which people by and large pay their taxes uh, and they do so fairly. And if the president of the United States, the most powerful person, can avoid paying his fair share of taxes, I think that is a problem. So that is an exception, and I think it could be uh, dealt with without necessarily a criminal uh, prosecution, but he should be forced to pay taxes if he owes them. Um, do you remember back in the 2016 debates when uh, Hillary Clinton said that he hadn't released his tax returns and that she was wondering whether he had uh, actually paid taxes? And and he didn't deny that he might not have paid his fair share. He said, that's because I'm smart. Right. Well, <laughs> I, you can you can you can certainly take legitimate deductions. Um, but if, as I suspect, he yes, was doing but, money laundering, that's a very different uh, thing. That's another matter. All right. I do want to spend a few minutes. Um, Tim, sorry to neglect you on this subject. Did you want to weigh in on the should we prosecute him? Uh, uh, no, not re- only to say okay. only to say that I, I would have an impossibly difficult time of seeing Joe Biden ever, ever go along with uh, with any prosecution of his predecessor because it would run diametrically counter to everything he has staked this campaign on. Yeah, I I think that's I think that's right. Um okay. Um let us talk for a moment about because um Trump now has an accomplishment for his first four years. Uh <laughs> it's finally happened. Yeah, <laughs> there was <is> one. <laughs> um he he uh, had a role in brokering a uh, deal where the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain have uh, normalized relations with the state of Israel, which is a very, well, I, I think it's a very good thing. Um, what, uh, Bill, do you think uh, is the lesson here uh, about um, Middle East diplomacy? Uh a lot of people that, thought this couldn't happen. Well, I was never one of them. Uh, okay. I, uh, first of all, there's an ancient principle that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. 
Uh, and as Iran has emerged in the minds of Sunni Arab countries as the principal threat uh, to their political survival, uh, the, uh, the imperative of creating a common front against the Iranians has driven an increasing amount of diplomatic uh, activity in the Middle East. Uh, and Israel, for better or for worse, is one of the basic building blocks of the anti-Iranian coalition. So that's point number one. And, and, you know, and as a footnote to that, the fact that Israel is by far the most technologically advanced country in the Middle East and in a position without transferring military assets to help Sunni Arab countries build up their economies, which would then increase their capacity to defend themselves, that fact isn't lost on any of the participants in the recent White House ceremony. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, it's important to realize that neither of the countries that quote unquote normalized relations with Israel was actually in a state of war against Israel. And that distinguishes them from the so-called frontline states. So what they did in effect was to formalize a set of informal relationships that had been developing for many, many years. And it was really an open secret throughout the region uh, that Israelis were showing up uh, in, in the UAE and in Bahrain and other places, even quietly in Saudi Arabia, in much greater numbers, and that the, the degree of economic and security cooperation was intensified. So this is certainly an accomplishment. How much of a game changer it's going to be remains to be seen. Uh, I do think it's a message to the Palestinians, as if one more were needed. Uh, that their, you know, their Nancy Reagan strategy of just saying no <laughs> has been a historical disaster for the Palestinian people and arguably doesn't even enjoy uh, the legitimacy of, you know, uh, of, an, of, a, uh, of a legitimate leadership carrying it out. So those are my somewhat random thoughts on the yeah. question. Bill reminds me of the probably the most quoted line ever from Middle East politics, but uh, it's there's it's often quoted for a reason, and that is Abba Ibn's famous dictum that uh, the Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity, and uh, and unfortunately they are paying for that very dearly. I think um, I I do I think it's worth pausing though over the fact. That so, for example, Barack Obama's last Secretary of State, um, John Kerry, uh, was very much of the view, as was Obama himself um, and others in the last administration, and frankly, a lot of the sort of um, di diplomacy types and in, in State Department types in in the U.S. that the key to Middle East peace, the key to subduing you know the the various uh, demons of the region, was finding a a solution to the Palestinian-Israel Israel conflict. And um, so events of this week certainly throw a wrench into that, I would argue, as do a lot of events over the last 15, 20 years. You know, uh, the, uh, the Iran-Iraq war didn't have anything to do with the Israel-Palestinian conflict, uh, the rise of ISIS, you know, all right. of these things did not have anything to do with Israel. Well, I think that's exactly right. And I will say I did watch uh, the signing ceremony. I listened to President Trump and he did say something that I think was was correct. And I'm you know just going to have to paraphrase it. But he made exactly that point that um, he sort of went around the traditional thinking or as people did. And instead of trying to broker an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, they decided to go around and make uh peace with uh, other Arab nations. And of course, without the support of those other Arab nations, uh, the Palestinians, you know, are in great, great trouble. Um, they can't do it on their own. And so I think that was an insight that was important. Uh, I also think that the fear of Iran is what is driving all of this. And if you want to look to uh, any action that Trump took, I think it was withdrawing from uh 
the uh, JCPOA. Um, I think that that did uh, the idea that, you know, Iran is going to pursue a nuclear weapon is probably, you know, closer today than it was uh, in getting those weapons, that that has uh, motivated the Saudis and others in the region, because that is the great fear. Uh, I think that the real achievement uh, for Trump will be if he can get an agreement uh, with the Saudis. And I guess the question is, do the Saudis believe that Trump is so important to them and keeping him in office is so important that they hand him such a deal and they do so before the election at a time when it could have a significant impact uh, with certain key demographics? Uh, Obviously, the Jewish vote in Florida is very important. And um, there are, you know, that that I think if he could, you know, win on that basis. And by the way, he's also doing better among Hispanics than I believe he should be uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, I think, you know, this could end up being uh, something that could play into the election in November. Tim, pulling the lens back a bit, um, some people could argue that... um, that the combined effect of the Obama administration um, and the Trump administration, and frankly, you could even go back to George W. Bush, because the U.S. is no longer seen as a steady, reliable ally to a lot of nations around the world. First of all, our foreign policy turns on a dime when the administration changes. Um, We have an Iran deal, then we withdraw from an Iran deal, you know. We're in the Paris Climate Accords, then we're out. Um, you know, George W. Bush felt that hugging Israel close was the best uh, policy, and uh, and Barack Obama felt that holding them at arm's length was the best policy. Um, isn't it possible that the message the U.S. is giving by this inconstancy is part of the reason that that these nations in in the Gulf have said, you know, we just need to look for a strong horse that's local and that has the same strategic interests that we do, namely Israel, who's concerned just as the Gulf Arabs are about Iran. Uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty pretty fair read of the situation, and I think it's one that uh, would not register much dissent uh, from you know Bush alumni or Obama alumni. Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly the 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 folks around this president, uh, the, you know, namely Jared Kushner, who, by the way, I, I just should step back for a moment and say for for all the the ribbing that Kushner has received over the last, you know, three and a half years, much of it deserved. Uh, I I think it's only fair to point out that two of the only real concrete uh, policy accomplishments in this administration, uh, the the First Step Act, which was uh, focused on reforming sentencing guidelines and criminal justice uh, policies, and now this, the the Abraham Accords, uh, were pretty much quarterbacked by Kushner. So just to just to give that rare uh, shout out to Jared Kushner, who I think does deserve real credit for both of those things. Um, but I think that, you know, when, when you when you talk to Jared and, and other folks around the president on some of the Middle East geopolitics, I think they have been focused from day one on what they viewed uh, as a sort of sphere of influence, sphere of control. And that's and that's Israel. They They believed that if they could I don't want to. I don't want to even say repair the damage done by Obama because I think that's overstating it. And frankly, I'm not sure that's even how some of them really view it. But I think, uh, to your point, if Obama was keeping them at arm's length, um, you know, the, the Trump administration's overriding, uh, you know, geopolitical priority here was to sort of uh, put put Israel in a friendly headlock and, and give it a noogie and and and. Uh, kiss its boo boos and make sure that that Netanyahu at all understood that that you know the Trump administration was going to be there to to do whatever they could to help not just facilitate peace but to bolster that 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 uh, that very image you were talking about a minute ago, Mona. The the sort of you know the stability and the strength of at least one democracy in the Middle East, and and they really went all in on that regard. And no one was clear that it would manifest itself in this way, but I do think that that is kind of the big picture takeaway here. That that if there was one real investment in the Middle East, it was it, it was into 
uh, sort of further bolstering uh, Israel's you know, credibility in the region in that specific way. Mm-hmm. Damon, um, I, I can guess that conservatives would argue that, you know, that Netanyahu, um, say what you will about his other problems, and he has plenty, but that he is a master of real politique and his threat to annex parts of the West Bank um, was kind of a classic move where he he made this threat and then it was something that he could give up because it really didn't amount to anything. Whereas normally you would have thought that to get this kind of an agreement with the Gulf Arab states, he would have had to say, okay, we'll halt all settlement activity or something else. But really all he gave up was a, was a sort of vaporous, you know, uh, 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 intention to next certain parts of the West Bank. And even that was easily enough uh, abandoned and that was it. Yeah, that's true. And it, and it, of course, domestically in Israel, it, it helped to keep his right flank uh, on board and enthusiastic for him through these rounds of indeterminate elections they've had over the last two years, uh, you know, seeming like he was tough enough to unilaterally annex the West Bank, kind of kept kept them on board at the same time, as you say, that it was a kind of now we can see in retrospect a kind of uh, deliberate overstatement or overclaiming of his position so that he could then back off of it and actually lose nothing um i mean i'm struck by the whole by the whole deal uh for uh, i forget if it was uh it was linda or bill who pointed out that um, that it really is a, a major change in the assumptions that have guided American, or maybe it was you, Mona, who said, the, a major change in the assumptions that have guided American policy in that part of the world for so long, where it was always assumed that you had to first solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem before anything else would happen, and that the Arab states wouldn't make more deals with Israel until progress was made on that front. And really, the I think it's this is of course this is good news this this these deals um, and of course if there's a Saudi deal that's a much bigger deal that's that's a very big one potentially um, but really the people who get who get truly screwed are the Palestinians this is uh, they will if they get a deal eventually presumably at some point it is uh, almost certainly going to be vastly worse than what they would have gotten 20 years ago if they had signed on the dotted line uh, with Bill Clinton at the, in the twilight hours of his presidency. And instead, uh, Arafat held out for more, and we've had this now 20-year detour that have, have really landed them with nothing at all. And it's, that, that is a truly sad outcome of the, of the deal, but I think it is the reality they now face. In 2000, Israel offered them full statehood on territory that included roughly 92% of the West Bank and all of Gaza with a capital in Jerusalem, and they said no. Um, all right, well, perhaps this, um, this the, another good aspect of this will be, especially if it spreads to other countries, there's talk of Sudan and Oman also, and of course, as you mentioned, Saudi Arabia, Maybe this will cause the Palestinians to rethink their rejectionist posture, and uh, maybe there will be hope on that front as well. We might as well (laughs) hope. Um, All right. Um, Let us now move to our highlights or lowlights. And Bill Galston, let's start with you. Well, uh, I'm going to break with tradition here, Mona. Okay. Uh, And I'll tell you how. Uh, the late great Norman Mailer once published a collection of essays entitled Advertisements for Myself. Uh, I always thought that that was the perfect title for everything he ever published. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but apparent, apparently, you know, he saw some distinctive qualities in, in this collection of essays. But I am, you know, I'm going to take a deep breath and refer to a piece of research that I just completed completed and posted on the Brookings website yesterday. And I'm doing this. This was a this was a snap decision on my part because it completes the story that Tim Alberta was telling. Uh, the Washington Post came out with two, I think, very sound surveys uh, 
one of Minnesota, the other of Wisconsin. Uh, and you know, whether, whether their numbers, the spread that they had in favor of Biden in those two states turned out to be correct or not, I do think that they illustrate a fundamental structural development that few anticipated and which could be momentous for Trump in 2020 election. And that is the growing gender gap within the white working class. Put simply, uh, and I did a deep dive into the crosstabs and compared them with Census Bureau data from the 2016 election, et cetera. As of now, white working class men are holding steady for Trump in those two states compared to 2016. But white working class women are deserting him in droves, with the result that there is now a 20 point gender gap within the working class, the white working class between men and women, when it comes to evaluating Trump's performance in office in general, looking at specific areas, or in voting intentions. And I think one of the big reasons that Joe Biden now has a six point edge uh, over over Trump in Wisconsin is that a lot of white working class women have grown very tired of the, you know, the blustery male act and no longer see exactly what's in it for them. <laughs> Linda, for the second time in two weeks, I have to say, mistake to give men the vote, you know, <laughs> but right. I guess we're stuck with them. Uh, what what are your what's your highlight or low light? Well, it's uh, pointing at something that is definitely a low light, and it comes from Slate magazine. Um, there's been a little news about this, but it hasn't been widely covered, and that is an allegation that there are four sterilizations taking place at detention centers, specifically the Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia. A complaint has been filed on behalf of a nurse who works at the detention center, and she alleges that somewhere between 17 or 18, women may have been forcibly sterilized while uh, in the custody of uh, the immigration forces, and they go in for gynecological procedures. One woman, for example, had a cyst on her ovary uh, and ended up uh, having uh, the wrong ovary removed and um, ended up being sterilized. Others have had full hysterectomies. And uh, it's a really serious allegation. And I point to the article, which is called Unpacking the Explosive Allegation that a Uterus Collector is Terrorizing Immigrant Women. Uh, there are some news elsewhere on this, but I think the Slate article in particular, number one, gives the background of forced sterilizations in the United States, which are a thing and have been practiced and in the not so distant past. Uh, in the United States, including in California against uh, Hispanic women, um, and certainly against black women and white women who were um, low IQ or may have had other emotional or mental problems. Um, it was something upheld by the Supreme Court. But it's a, a little unclear now whether or not this is going on. And I think Slate does a really good job of uh, exposing uh, what we know, uh, asking for for more information, but not jumping to the conclusion that this is actually happening, rather insisting that there be a full investigation. Yes, file under horrific, if true. Um, yeah. Okay, Tim Alberta. So I, I assume I wasn't briefed on this portion of the, of the program. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, no, that's okay. I thought you knew. I th I'm I so sorry. I'm supposed to tell you either some really good news or some really bad news. Oh, let's have good. Okay. No, I'll give you something that is, uh, I suppose, in the eye of the beholder. But among the other great culture wars of 2020, Big Ten football and, and college football more broadly has been in the crosshairs, obviously, due to um, COVID-19 and, and the huge spikes of, of case numbers on college campuses. And uh, I am a child of the Big Ten and, and an alum of Michigan State University and a diehard college football fan. And so the news uh, just this week that the Big Ten was reversing itself and that 
teams would begin playing in October uh, was, I think, welcome news, but also a source of, uh, of some concern and, and, and not just about, you know, these, uh, these student athletes getting sick or, or uh, them spreading the, the virus around campus, but also it, it raises questions about priorities in American life, quite frankly, and the, uh, you know, the testing capacity that was promised to these schools in order to get them back on board. Uh, you do wonder why that same testing capacity isn't made available to schools and to daycare centers and to, uh, you know, therapy clinics where special education kids aren't able to attend right now uh, because of uh, some of some of the rules in place. So I am, you know, both thrilled to be able to watch the Spartans get back on the field and hopefully put a halfway decent season together next month. Um, but the the circumstances under which uh, they are returning to the gridiron are a bit concerning. And obviously the the uh, sort of naked politi- politicizing of the situation uh, by the president uh, and by some others is uh, just enough to make me want to not turn on uh, the television on Saturdays at all. Okay, Tim, you said this was good news. I mean, <laughs> Sorry. it took a real turn there. Um, <laughs> a perfect crystallization of 2020, though, there really is no good news. I, even, even, even hiding behind every facade of good news is, is bad news. All That's right. as good as it gets, Mona. <laughs> <laughs> Damon, what do you have for us? Uh, well, along the, the it goes very well with the theme that uh, Tim and Linda uh, talked about earlier, having to do with uh, kind of demographics being destiny and actually whether they are. Uh, Ross Douthit in the New York Times, one of my favorite columnists, has a, had a column this week titled, Which Party Represents the Racial Future?, in which he very patiently and carefully, I think, sorts through some polling data and talks about uh, this question about whether it is in fact true that the Democrats are going to be the multicultural party that will eventually win because the country is becoming majority minority and the Republicans are kind of headed into oblivion trying to keep it going with just a dwindling white electorate. And he he argues that there is some evidence, as Linda noted earlier, that, uh, that the Hispanic vote is definitely more complicated than that. There have been some recent polls showing Trump uh, on track at the moment to get over 40% of the Hispanic vote, which would be its highest in quite a long time for a Republican. And the fact that it's Trump, as opposed to, say, Mitt Romney or John McCain, uh, points to an appeal that a uh, Trumpian style, the hyper masculine kind of, uh, you know, caricatured masculine, cartoonish masculinity uh, could hold for certain segments of the population that could really scramble some of these assumptions that we've been making Uh, You know, and even looping this into what Bill was saying about Minnesota and Wisconsin, what if what if, in fact, in the end, uh, the Trumpian appeal is not really a racial appeal at heart? It's more of an appeal to men. Uh, And that becomes more of a cleavage in our politics, rather a gendered one rather than a racial one. That's an interesting question. And Dalvit's piece can help us to start thinking. about. I would like to highlight um, two pieces that. address a phenomenon that I'm concerned about. Um, it's uh, uh, a phenomenon on among right-wing intellectuals, um, many of them religious Catholics, um, to reject the Enlightenment and reject uh, liberalism, small l. Um, uh, and and uh, the first is by Kathy Young, Reports of Liberalism's Death, a reply to Yoram Hazoni. Hazoni is the uh, Israeli-American um, intellectual who uh, is behind those national conservatism conferences that you've heard about. Um, and uh, and she, she has a very learned and interesting uh, response on uh, what, what you lose if you abandon the idea of liberalism. And the other is by our own Damon Linker, um, called The Conservatives Who Want to Undo the Enlightenment. Um, 
it's important to pay attention to these trends. Uh, this is something very new on the um, on the right. That is, well, it harkens back to a much older tradition on the right, but it is certainly, it has not been the tone of the right at all in the last 50 or 60 years. Um, and uh, this this new eruption of, um, of kind of throne and altar conservatism is, uh, I think, quite antithetical to the American experiment and uh, something very much to keep our eye on. All right. Uh, well, we thank everyone for listening. We hope people will subscribe to uh, the Bulwark Plus. We hope people will continue to tell their friends about this podcast, which, by the way, popped up. These things bounce around a lot, these measurements, but it popped into the top 100 podcasts for a couple of weeks uh, in the last few um, and that's amazing since we really have only been doing this for about six months. So, um, so thank you all. That's your doing. And, uh, we appreciate the word of mouth. We appreciate the ratings and reviews, which help other people to find the podcast. And, uh, if you feel as I hope you do that, this is kind of an oasis of sanity in a very weird world. Um, please help us uh, gain more listeners and, uh, we will be back and do this again next week. 